Father, we, uh, we sit here with our hearts bowed to your sovereignty, to your great creation, to your inexplicable love for us, for the mercy that transcends a, a disobedient and sometimes very violent human history. And we bend our hearts and are responsive and are thankful for what you've done for us. But we also, this morning, want to open our minds to what your spirit wants to say. So we would pray that your wood, word would be illumined by your spirit and all the other things that are just rustling in our minds, that uh, you would set them apart for a time. That as uh, here, as well as in Lockport, as we just sit and we contemplate your inspired word, spoken, protected, down, so, down through so many thousands of years, as we just contemplate a few of those words this morning, that you will use them to not only instruct us, but to, deep, to dig deeper foundations of connection and relationship to you. We thank you that we rely upon you to do the work that we cannot do, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As I get older, I find that we live in just about the noisiest society that has ever existed. I'm not talking about the street noise so much or your noisy next door neighbor or the person sitting next to me on an airplane chewing gum for five hours or something like that. I'm talking about the noise of a culture that wants our attention through radio or TV or internet or my iPhone or any other kind of technology or even just passive things like billboards. People want to speak to us. Noise everywhere. They want us to buy something. They want us to think something. They want us to change something. Whatever it is, we live surrounded by what has to be the noisiest time in human history. And so it seems to me, apropos, that every once in a while, we stand back and think about, ponder, that in spite of all odds, in spite of all of this, God has created us for relationship with himself. In fact, according to scripture, as we're going to see, there is no other reason for human history then the creative, omniscient, powerful God creates something like unto himself called Adam and Eve and we their children and says, with them I am going to have a, a unique relationship. The words I would like to focus on this morning are very few, but they are important. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 25, and I'm only going to read to 22, though I think to 25 will be up on, on the screen for you. This is what the writer says. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, that is by a new and living way opened up for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith having or having had, had our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So that in spite of everything else, first, in spite of the original disobedience that God created Adam and Eve with an unconfirmed righteousness and yet a right to choose and yet in a moment when they could have chosen righteousness in a way that you and I don't have the same opportunity right now. They had an opportunity to choose what God wanted for them and they disobeyed. The original, in spite of the original failure, in spite of our disobedience, because the Bible makes it clear that we follow in the same tracks of Adam and Eve because we born after them of their own nature, confirmed by our own disobedience, that we not only do the same thing, but we would have done the same thing. In spite of the original disobedience, in spite of our own disobedience, in spite of all the busyness that now as recreated beings in the image of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, even we choose 
busyness often over relationship. In spite of all of that, God still calls us to something unique with himself. And that's what the words of Hebrews invites us to. In fact, the words here are really inadequate to explain everything that the writer of Hebrews is saying. As there has been an argument that began back in chapter 1 and was concluded somewhat by chapter 9, but in 9 and 10, even there's a crescendo of growth to a conviction that finally marks itself here. And throughout the book, he has made it very clear that Jesus is higher than the angels, that he's more important than Moses, that he's more important than Aaron, and the whole system of relationship with God that came through the law. He is like unto that one that he chose to, to identify called Melchizedek, of which we know very little, but we know this. The uniqueness of Melchizedek was his indestructible life that he possessed, and Jesus is like unto that. Imagine for a moment God's invitation into his presence. Creator, sustainer, judge, he invites us, desires us in his presence. That's where the story begins in Genesis 1 and 2. I like to go back to the first 11 or 12 chapters of Genesis on a regular basis to remind myself that that's where the story and all that it's about starts. Everything else becomes subplot to those realities. It is by nature the divine design that begins to give us understanding of everything else. And so in Genesis chapter 1, he says, Then God said, Let us make man, that's you and me, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over all the livestock, over all the earth, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. We were not just a burp of biological inexplicability. We were created by the intention of God, unique to anything else in his, his creation, to be like him and to be in his image. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the whole face of the earth and every tree that has fruit with it, seed with it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all this that he had done and said it was very good. And there was morning and there was evening, the sixth day. At the very beginning, God has one intention that will map itself out through what we now call human history. And that is, number one, that we would on one side be relationship with him, and on the other, we would be representation of him. Nothing else in the universe has the ability to represent God like we who bear both his image and his likeness. And so that's where the story, story starts. But the failure brings along another necessity. And that's what Hebrews chapter 10 is all about. That therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place. There were generations of people who would have never thought that. There are still people who believe that to go into a holy place is not humanly permissible. There are still genres of religion, even genres of just human experience. Little places that where it says, like I came up today, only authorized personnel allowed. There are places that we set apart as being holy, unique, different, not just religiously. And you're not allowed in there. There have been whole generations of human experience, and there are still today people who believe of every religious ilk that you and I do not have the right to have the relationship with that kind of God, much less to enter into his presence. But that's where he starts the invitation, that he has provided a way, a way into relationship that we might be restored to God's original contentions. 
And so notice how he says this. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, we know we belong in the presence of God, that he has provided a way because the blood of Jesus has done something that nothing else could, could ever do. You couldn't do for yourself. Your mother, your father, other friends, no, no uh, potentate, no king, no emperor, nobody could do for you. Your personal guilt had to be paid for by a personal payment. And the Son of God does that. And so he gives his blood by a new and a living way opened up through us through the curtain that is his body. God has provided a way through the blood of Jesus Christ for the barrier that stands between your disobedience and God's righteousness to be completely solved. And so in Jesus Christ, as we saw, we saw earlier this morning, the picture of Romans chapter 6, that we are crucified, buried, and resurrected. What we were is nailed to a cross. It dies. So that what comes up is a new person like unto the image of Jesus Christ, the new Adam, the last Adam, the one that does what the first Adam could not do. So we have confidence to enter because we belong through the blood of Jesus Christ. But that's not all. He says not only is there a way provided because of Jesus, there's a way provided because he now acts as priest on our behalf. Verse 21, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, Jesus continues to act on your behalf and my behalf. I think there's an interesting picture from Job chapter 1 and 2 that if we take that as being somewhat symbolic of what goes on on a regular basis, a basis in heaven, then there is a regular moment at which Satan is entering or is actually, I think, demanded to be in the presence of God when he finds reason to accuse you and me for things that he knows we've done and we know we have done, we have no excuse for as being redeemed ones and Satan thinks he gains advantage because he has found a chink in your armor, or more importantly, a chink in the complete salvation of God in his son Jesus Christ, and is not afraid to accuse you, for he is the accuser of the brethren. And at that moment, the one who is the propitiation, that means the one who is the payment, if we could look at it rhetorically, from the right hand of the Father simply reaches over and says, that's true, Father, but that place is a proof that a payment was made on your behalf. And so Jesus continues to be your advocate against that one who is your adversary, who would love to destroy you, but the payment has been made. God has provided a way. The second thing the writer of Hebrews says to us is that he has also provided an invitation. You say, well, why didn't he do the invitation first? Because he had to provide a way. So the way has been provided, but on top of that provision, he says to you and me, I have an invitation to you. Notice what he says there in the next verse. He simply says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, that is by a new and living way, opened up through the body of Jesus, and since he is actively advocating on our behalf over the house of God, let us draw near to God. Let us draw near to God. There's an invitation. Every day and without hesitation. I always hope, I always hope, but I am optimistically skeptical. I always hope that when we gather on Sunday morning, it's a celebration of what's already gone on all week. It's not an effort to try to create what I have not been living. Now that's not a slam or a criticism, It's a re-warning that God intends something different. You see, this place is not holy. Only the people in it are holy. The ones who belong to Jesus. And so we as the holy ones gather, what we do is bring a week of accumulated connection with the living God. I hope. 
a week of accumulated partying that what millions of people believe is impossible, you've lived. Every day, in every way, in every moment, in a relationship in the presence of the living God. Because that's God's invitation in Jesus Christ. You see, it's, it's not just to eternity. It's not just to escape hell. It's not just become a Christian. It's not just to get over the difficulties and if I'm just a little bit moral, maybe I'll feel good about myself. It is to be restored to the genius of the living God. To have the audacity to believe that every moment can be lived in his presence. And that becomes the genius of your representation. There is an invitation every day and without hesitation. The third thing that the writer says is that he has prepared us for this. He's got a way that he gives to us. He's got an invitation that is continual. And he has prepared us for this. I like this one. Listen to what he says. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, verse 22, let us draw near to God. With a sincere heart. Now let's don't fiend anything. Let's don't fake it. Let's don't try to be what we're not. Because you can do that with me, but you can't do it with God. Let's just come with an open, sincere heart. I am what I am. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter where you've come from. All that matters is where you're headed. It doesn't matter how far down your path here it is. It doesn't matter how much Bible you know. It doesn't how much how much flesh is still he is he pouring out of your life. It doesn't how many mistakes you made this week. It's where you're headed. Where is your face headed? Is it fed, headed in relationship with God, or somehow is it deviated from that, or is it against it? In the middle of that, he reminds us that we come with this kind of a sincere heart because number one. We have had our conscience sprinkled with blood, and it's no longer guilty. If, if God gave me nothing else to give me a free conscience would be the greatest gift on earth that I could ever think of. To know that in spite of imperfection, in spite of difficulties, in spite of a battle we're going to see in a minute that continues to go on, I confront every day free of conscience. I'm never looking over my shoulder. That doesn't mean I don't deal with forgiveness. That doesn't mean I don't need to learn more. It doesn't mean that God doesn't want to do more. But I never look over my shoulder. Past, present, future. For those who are in Jesus Christ, there is this sense that your heart is totally clean and clear. You owe nobody the final payment for who you are not, if I can use it that way. Clean conscience. It allows me to enter into a relationship with you of imperfection with a sense of conviction that God will not hold me responsible for eternity for the imperfections I still have, but encourages me to greater sense of dependence on him. All of that gets put into balance, of course. How many people I meet are still walking around with a guilty conscience? Now, I'm not saying this in a light way. I'm not saying I simply, well, you know, who gives a rip? To hell with him, that's his problem. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying deep down inside, the payment has been made and God has used the blood to wash away the guilty conscience and give me a new one. The second thing he's done is he's washed my body with water. Probably a symbolism, a, a picture of the symbolism of what went on this morning in baptism, but something more important going on here. I think what he said is that now my conscience has been washed by the blood. I don't have the old guilty conscience, so therefore I th kept thinking that if I was religious, I had to find a way to make God happy with me. Or if I wasn't religious, that conscience spoke to me from time to time and eventually it got so seared that I didn't listen to anything anymore. But God has washed all that away and get me something pure and white, clean, no stains that I can live every day 
in the realization that his mercies are new every day. And I begin every day with a slate that's clean before God. But second, he's washed my body. And I think what that means is, is the realization that God knows that he's put a new heart and a new mind, but it still lives in an old body. Uh, let me just read real quickly from Romans chapter six, and we don't have time to explain it, but I want you to capture this because this is the essence of having that, that relationship with God on a daily basis. Let me read in verses five and following. Romans six is a powerful passage. It says, if we have been united with him, that is with Jesus, like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that that old self, the one that was dominated by sin, that old self was crucified. It doesn't exist that way anymore. It was crucified with him. So that the body which is consumed by, we might say, the body of sin might be done away with. That is, it doesn't have the same relationship inside of me that it used to have that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer is master over him. The death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God in the same way, in the same way. Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. I think what, what, what is being said to us in Hebrews is that when God washes our body, he takes the mastery of sin out of the center of your life and puts the spirit in the middle of the center. I do not believe that there's a conflict in the center of my life. I am one who belongs to God for eternity. The kingdom of God, as he goes on to say, has been put, built up in my life. God is on the throne. Or I don't belong to Jesus. But there is in my body, this body, with the residue of the flesh that used to dominate me, master me. I used to do everything the flesh told me to do. And the only way it got controlled was human discipline. That's all it was. I learned not to say certain things because I knew if I said them, I could get myself in trouble. I learned not to do things because if I got caught, I might go to jail. I learned not to, to, to speak or to do certain things in the family because I found out that if I said them in the wrong way, my wife wasn't happy. And if she wasn't happy, life in the family could be hell. I simply learned at a human level to dominate to one degree or another the flesh. But God says that's over. I am in the center. My spirit lives in you. My spirit now speaks life to you. But there's still a battle in my body. And that's where intimacy comes from. The battle in the body. Not the battle in the heart. Because if you belong to Jesus, the heart has been renewed. And he is constantly wooing you to the realities of relationship with God. But your body is saying no. Your body's lazy. Your body is used to the flesh doing what it wanted to do, and all of a sudden, it has to learn to listen to what the Spirit wants to say, and the flesh intercedes. A couple weeks ago, I was with some pastors on a weekend. We were talking about this topic, and one of the ladies said it exactly as it was. She said, you know, I knew I needed to spend time with God in his word. I knew that. I knew it was inspired. I knew it was alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. I knew that's what God wanted for me. I knew that when I took it regularly, there was something sweet about it. I knew, I knew, I knew. But I was lazy. Inconsistent. And then I made a commitment to my body. <laughs> that my heart is going to begin to tell my body what to do. And I started finding time every day in God's word. And in the beginning, it seemed a little laborious, but I found something over time. The more often I did it, all of a sudden, work, laboriousness, I need to do it, got supplanted with joy. What happened? The body didn't want to do it, and so therefore the body said to the mind, this is work. This is ridiculous. Let's don't do this. Why should I discipline myself? But the Spirit was saying to me, 
discipline your body. Spend time with me. Say no to the flesh. Say yes to me. She discovered when she started to say yes to the spirit and no to her body in this little way of getting up on a daily basis and finding time in God's word, it changed her feeling because the feelings of the spirit are joy. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. That's what he gives. A lot of people hate Christianity, even though they're Christians, because they're still dominated by the flesh telling them what to do. Not dominated, heavily influenced. They say yes to the flesh rather than to the spirit. You've been washed. Your body has been prepared for relationship with God. You've got to say yes to the spirit. And so he has provided a way. He has made an invitation. And he has prepared us for this. Well, what does all this mean? It seems to me that there's five things I want you to take away from this. That as you think about God in this book, yeah? It's not a mystery book. It's not a theology book. It's not an encyclopedia. If it is, then it's going to get dry. It is alive and active. It's the word of the living God in which I have interaction with him. You see, he has to have something to say to me. And he says, look, I already said it. So in scripture and time and devotion and quietness and in meditation, I give God the spirit a chance to speak to me. And in prayer, I speak back to him. It's that simple. In scripture, he speaks to me. In prayer, I speak back to him. And that becomes a way to say yes to the spirit and no to my flesh, that God would take work and make it joy. Five things. Number one, as I look at God and his word, it seems to me we have to start with this conviction. It is to be understood. In John chapter six, there's a, a very difficult passage where Jesus says to Everybody gathered, I am the bread of life. And he goes on to talk about how you have to eat this bread. You have to be willing to realize this bread came from heaven, and it's not like any other bread. And everybody gets a little confused because, you know, what's he really saying here? Is he telling me to eat him? I mean, that makes no sense. And so there was confusion, and, and he finally turns to the, the disciples, and they were confused, and some of the disciples had left him, and he said, uh, are you going to leave too? And they say to him, where would we go? You have the words of life. I can guarantee you, if you don't learn to discipline your fast and say yes to the Spirit by engaging this book, life will not necessarily taste sweet. Now, maybe you have a good income, maybe you have a nice house, maybe you have a good retirement, maybe everything you hope to have until you die is in place, but, you know, for most of us, probably not. And at any moment, that can come undone. And yet God says, you don't have to be pulled and yanked by all those things. Start the day with me, live the day with me, because I am to be understood. The second thing I think he wants to say to us this morning is that not only I to be understood, I'm to be sought. You see, this is the only book I know of that is the most reliable source of confidence available to us. His word, written and preserved. Every day you gotta enter into it. Don't tell me you didn't have time because when you tell me you didn't have time, what you're telling me is my flesh didn't want it and I was lazy. I wasn't willing to say no to my flesh, my body, because I didn't want to. I allowed it to say to me, you don't need it, you're a Christian, you've got this. It allowed you, who knows what it allowed you to say to you? But when you allow it to say anything then you need it every day, then you're basically saying to God, I'm not gonna give you any stuff to work with. I'm not gonna give you any words in the front part of my mind and my heart for you to work on today. I'm gonna remember the words that Jerry told me last Sunday. I'm gonna remember the words of, of, that I read a year ago. I'm gonna remember the words that I went through in my baptism. And those words get forgotten easily. This word is renewed on a regular basis. It's alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. 
If you want to be in joy, give the Spirit some stuff to work with. God is meant to be sought. And as you seek him, you come with responsiveness, absolutely. You come listening in the word of God to what he wants to say. You come thinking about that. I don't care how long you spend in it. If you read 10 verses and one jumps out, then spend some time thinking about that verse. You spend time reflecting, submitting, obeying. Now you don't understand. You get paid to do this. Uh, listen. One of the things I'm discovering all over America is men in key positions and their wives, when I ask them the question, how's your spiritual life going? That is, how are you doing and listening to God that joy might be in you? The, the primary answer I get out of 90% of them, inconsistent. And so I say to them, well, if you're inconsistent, you tell me how your people will ever be consistent. Well, I'm busy. It's a body excuse. God says, I made you for me. <laughs> and this is the easiest way for you to understand me because this is the word I have protected that belongs to you. This is not everything you'll discover someday, but this is everything I have for you right now. Meet me in it, and I'll meet you. He's to be sought after. He's to be understood Thirdly, it seems to me that when we talk about these words, this is what God is saying is true life. You see, this was the discussion that, that Jesus had with Nicodemus. Nicodemus had all the facts. And he came to Jesus, I think, really seeking for how do I go on to the next level? What are some of the facts I've missed? missed? Tell me some more. I'm listening, I'm watching, and I'm intrigued by your life. I think I want to be a follower. And Jesus says to him, Nick, you don't understand. You can't follow in that path. That one's got to die, and you have become, got to be born again. You've got to be new. Because only when you become new are you living real life. Yes, all of this life is still here, and the relationships are here, and the people are here, and creation is here, and work is here, and rest is here, but this has been so conditioned by so many generations of humanity in rebellion to God that this is not the life God has for people. All of the people. God never, never dreamed up little 10-year-olds being taken out and being abused by a bunch of men. That's not God's idea of life. God's idea of life in terms of working to accumulate, that's not God's idea. That's man's idea. That's how we corrupt the genius of real life that God wants to give to people. And he will give to those who choose to be followers someday. But even now, he says, you can make a choice. Say no to the flesh, say yes to the spirit, and I'll give you a taste of what real life really looks like. It'll change your relationships. It'll change the way you think about money. It'll change the accumulation spirit that the world gives to you. And it'll teach you to hold your hands open. It'll say thank you for everything that God gives you, and it'll put it in an open hand. Because God says... Life is giving, not taking. God says that life is husbands loving their wives like their own body and wives being respectful. That, that God says that's life. Go back and read the Sermon on the Mount from that point of view. That is God's description of life. It gets all screwed up by humanity. But God says, I'll give you a taste of it because that's real life. Fourth, I want you to understand this. He has inbred this into us by the new birth. You and I do not have to think a way to conjure this up. There is lurking in your body, in your heart and your mind. We'll just leave it that way. There is lurking somewhere in you, if you belong to Jesus, an inbredness by the Spirit of God that is a new seed that seeks after God. And you've got to allow that to come to the forefront. You've got one way of living. It used to be dominated by the flesh. And many of us have simply taken the flesh and still trying to do religion. God says, no, that dies and this lives. You've got to say no to this one and yes to this one. Because if you say yes to this in my word, I will give to you what I have placed in you. My seed is in you. My spirit is in you. My spirit knows how to grow 
the seed that is in you. You have been inbred with this new life. And then finally, that is ministered by the Spirit of God. And so this is normal life in God's point of view. Living, listening daily through the word to the Spirit who is within us. Listening moment by moment to the Holy Spirit in circumstance, in others, in us, and learning to do what he tells us to do. You say, well, that sounds like a very unorganized life. Oh, well, it is organized by God, but no, it looks unorganized to me. I'm not sure where it's going. The only thing I know about it, it's going to love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, kindness, goodness, self-control, stewardship of life, and all the things God wants. I know it's going there. Where else is it going? I don't know. Maybe I'll give away my car. Maybe I'll share my car. Maybe I'll share my house. Maybe I'll say forgiveness. I'll ask forgiveness of somebody who I don't think deserves me to. Who knows what I'll do when the Spirit begins to speak the Word of God into a life that is listening on a regular basis. Who knows what he'll say? But you'll do it. You'll be rooted in the Word of God. You'll be tethered. Rooted daily. Tethered You'll do nothing outside of its expressions because that's, his defi- that's God's definition of life until Jesus comes again. I conclude that the Christian life is to meant to be invested. If you take those two things apart, you don't have a Christian life. The Christian life is meant to be invested as an act of worship into the kingdom of God. But in order to effectively invest it, we must have something worth investing. We must learn to live the sacrament of life under his solemn sovereignty over our daily life. And then we have something to invest. Otherwise, it's just wood, hay, and stubble. Even if it's cloaked over by religious duty, it's worthless to God. The life he wants is the life that has been bred by him through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and is superintended by the Spirit of God who's always speaking into your life the words of life. Don't think you can get through the kind of life that God wants and not find personal, private, intimate time with the living God in his living word. Otherwise, it's just laziness. It's allowing the spirit to continue to speak to a new nature. Rather, it's allowing the flesh to continue to dictate where the spirit wants to speak to what God has put in you. I challenge you. I don't know what you want to do. Five minutes a day. Those are just baby steps. Five minutes a day with the living word, thinking, reflecting, meditating, speaking back, submitting, obeying. And you're going to find that your new nature rises with new feelings that your flesh doesn't recognize. But God wants to give you. Father, we thank you for all that you've done on our behalf. You have been so wise in anticipation, having been created once in your image, in Adam and Eve, you have now given us the possibility of being recreated in your perfect image, in your son, Jesus Christ. And I pray for these people this morning here that they would wake up if necessary, but reaffirm if necessary that the inbredness of the Spirit of God needs to be fed by the Word of God. And that we will say no to the fleshly desires that war against the new inbredness of the Spirit of God so that we might experience the full joy of the living God giving us real life. I pray for them. That they would say no to that flesh and say yes to the Spirit and find growing time every day, no matter what it takes, to join in relationship with you. And we ask it in Jesus' name.
A couple things I want to mention to you. One, it seems that every time God speaks through my buddy Dwight, there are things that I want to leave behind and there are things that I want to embrace. It's as if when God speaks through him, I just think to myself, there's some stuff I need to leave. Some things in my head, some things in my body that I, I want to leave behind because there is a reality that I want to embrace that's deeper and richer than I dreamed or imagined. I, I listened to what he just said and I'm thinking to myself, self, I got some work to do. That's me talking. I'm not talking about you. You got your own problems. You deal with yourself. I'm thinking about me. Some of you here may be in a place where you have never before actually in a serious faith way turned from your sin and put your absolute confidence, faith, trust, cast all your weight upon God's son Jesus that you might experience new life, that you might be born from above. You may have never done that, experienced that. And if that's you, whether you're here on this campus or whether you're at the Lockport campus, I wanna encourage you when I dismiss you in just a moment to come by the fireside room, touch base with pastors that'll be there, prayer partners that'll be there here on this campus or at Lockport, Pastor Matt will give you instruction about what it means to begin this new relationship with God where you can be now recreated into a new nature. And then there may be some of you who said, well, what do I do with this? Well, you just got a real clear challenge just a moment ago. You may not have even been a person who really starts in a day-by-day -day basis to do anything with God and his word. It's why we sound like a skipping CD to you every week saying, turn over that little note page. And it, you may have another plan, great. But if you don't have any plan, you've got something in your hand day by day with scripture to spend time with God, to reflect on some questions, to listen to God, to speak to God, to have God speak to you. It's there for you. The question is, are you going to choose a life that somehow assumes that there's such a thing as life without intimate communion with God? Or are you gonna say no to your body, no to your flesh, no to your laziness, and start to allow the Spirit of God to do what he wants to do in your life? Those are the questions we get confronted with. We were confronted with them in a very clear way today, and I thank God for it. So there's your challenge. There's what God is asking of us. By the way, when Dwight said five minutes, that's not a standard. He's just saying, if you're doing nothing, do something. Take a step in the right direction. You're not gonna, if you're growing in faith and all that kind of stuff, you'll, you'll find yourself just finding time in God's word and it gets away from you. Your time just gets away from you. You're just spending time with the Lord and then you realize, I better go to work. I'm gonna get fired, you know? Why are you late? I was with God. <laughs> Did he write you an excuse? No, no. Yes, no, I, I don't know. Right? So this is where we begin, ladies and gentlemen. Those are your responsibilities. Those are your challenges. I'm asking you to, to embrace them. And then on your way out, I'm going to close in prayer, but on your way out, just as a word of reminder, it's been in your worship folder for a couple of weeks and uh, been on the screens for a couple of weeks. If you're a member and you desire to attend um, just our annual uh, family meeting where we kind of present to you the year in review pretty much financially, um, then that's at the conclusion of the next service. We just can't do it after this one, but we can do it after the next one. So if you desire to either A, hang around for a second service, you can't all do that. We went ever in or come back over or whatever. Obviously, the invitation is there for you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the day, for your word for the reminder of new life and new nature that's been implanted into us by the Spirit of God. I pray you would help us to recognize that the reality of life comes from communion with you, intimacy with you. 
help us, strengthen us, help us to listen to the voice of the Spirit of God in our hearts and lives. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I hope you have a great week.